Hello and welcome back to the channel. It is Mark from Apprentice One to One, and today we're going to have a look at a service head and speak about diverted neutral currents or circulating neutral currents within earthing systems and how they could be potentially dangerous or perfectly normal. And before I get into all of that, I want to point you at the excellent video that JW, aka John Ward, has popped out last week, really explaining in fine detail through his excellent demonstration board he's built up of the dangers that can present when the neutral in a TNCS supply arrangement in particular goes down and some of the things we can do as electricians to help monitor it. I'm going to set it out here with a real world example of a service head that is currently exposed and we can run through some of the checks we can make for any circulating currents that maybe are in places traditionally we wouldn't expect them and some of the things we can do to mitigate them being there whilst working on deconstructed electrical systems. Let's get straight to it. So before we get into some of the ways you can look at keeping yourself safe from circulating um, currents within the earthing system, so that's neutral currents that are making their way through the earthing within an installation, and by design on a PME TNCS earthing arrangement, that's always going to happen. It's perfectly normal and it's expected. But we'll look at how you can carry out some basic checks to see if there's anything there that's potentially dangerous, or if it's just normal, and then some of the approaches you can take to try and keep yourself safe whilst working in and around this stuff. Now this service head is currently isolated, the DNO are doing some repair work out in the street, and they've got the covers off in here, I assume, so they can make some measurements and testing of themselves. But I thought while that was all open, it was a good time to have a look inside and see what all this is for those who've never seen behind the cover of a service head on a three-phase system. You can see we've got our 300 amp fuses and we've got our red, yellow and blue phase, which are the old colours for three phase. And then we've got the armorings, if you like, which are aluminium in nature, I believe, coming up into the neutral block, which then connects up into the meters to string along a neutral feed into those and also take a neutral feed out to the first distribution board on this installation and you can see there the main earth is also tagged into that so in essence the neutral and the earth are all connected into the armorings here and you'll see in the description that the Yorkshire Electricity Board as it was then and is now Northern Power Grid have left a warning notice on here to say not to interfere with the equipment because the seals um, are in place and also only to operate a 100 amp switch if there is one there, not to interfere with anything else. And most importantly, that the bonds to water and gas should not be removed at any time. So they're trying to ensure the equipotential zone within an installation stays in place. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. But I wanted to show you what's actually inside this to give a clearer understanding. So your three phases come in, and if you're using three phase equipment, then that power will just be related to those phases and it should result in no current returning through the neutral. If, however, you're using a, a single phase load, for example, the return current will come through the neutral and return back through the service cable. But some of that, by the very nature of a PME system, and it's to be totally expected due to current taking the path of least resistance, some will make its way into the earthing system and travel back to the source through those means. And there's no way of getting around that or stopping that from happening. And as I've said at the start of this video, if you go and look at the John Ward video he's put out very recently, that explains it in great detail far better than I ever could. But the principle remains, in normal operation, that will always happen. Let's have a look at how we can monitor what is actually going on within the earthing system and if it's potentially dangerous or not. So there are a few things that you can use to monitor for circulating currents within the earthing system and one is a clamp meter, in this case the TIS 570 AC DC leakage clamp and this will check for any AC and DC currents that may be flowing within the earthing system or other conductors for that matter on your installation. Now as I've said the DNO are busy doing some repair work on this supply but currently we have power present so I'm going to jump on and record this video while I can. If I pop this around the main earth terminal and I'll turn the backlight on there you can see we've got about 50 milliamps of current flowing within the earthing conductor and I would anticipate that has been about right based on the consumption we've got here in our own unit and the neighbouring units there's around 30 on this little sub row of units on the estate and they're all going to share the same supply cables and all tie in together on the PME arrangement so I would say that that's a normal value to expect now if you were seeing something above the milliamp range 
I would be looking at calling 105 and getting the DNO to verify if there is an issue on the network before we carry out any deconstruction of the earthing system. And that's because there could be a potential for voltage to exist between the main earth cable coming into the property and also any of the bonds, so your water and gas. And when you've got those deconstructed, that potential could be potentially in front of your face and in your hands. So it's one to be aware of. Another tool you can use is a contact voltage indicator. Now I much prefer these to the non-contact varieties because you have to have a physical connection onto the component and they are super duper reliable in what they present as a very basic level of checking for voltages. And you simply touch that onto exposed metallic parts. So in this case we can go straight onto that combined neutral and earth cable and we can do the check with the test button to make sure it's operating correctly. Any voltage of 50 volts would result in this illuminating. If you want to go off and see a bit more about contact voltage indicators and how they work, I've done a video on my main channel, Mark the Sparky Allison, which covers these two products. So there's the Q-Tech contact voltage indicator and this one from Martindale. And we'll speak a little bit about diverted neutral currents in that video as well. But these are really useful because you can probe onto your gas pipe work, your water pipe work, any of the bonding connections themselves the distribution equipment, uh, even circuit accessories, and see if there is voltage present within the system before you start to work on it. Now, if you was to detect any voltage, again, 105 to the DNO, if you are happy that that is coming from external to your installation, and they'll be able to come out and do some checks and see exactly what's going on. And equally, while you've got a system deconstructed, if all these tests come back clear, it's worthwhile considering containing the ends of those cables whilst you are carrying out your work, because of course there is a potential that the PME fault might occur after you've started, particularly on a three-phase distribution board replacement that could run over a weekend, for example. You know, you might have diligently checked for this at the point you start to take things apart, but later on, when you're putting it back together, that fault could then be in place. So it's worthwhile putting the ends of your bonds within terminal blocks, for example, or junction boxes or something of that nature, just to cover over the ends and give yourself an element of protection from those metal parts that could contain voltages and currents that could potentially hurt you. So having taken a look at the things we can do for monitor for these circulating currents, neutral diversion currents, diverted neutral currents, whatever we want to call them, what is the history behind it and what are the regulations telling us right now? And we're going to have a look at that. The first part of call should always be BS7671 and then the guidance documents that spill out from that. So we'll get to that in a minute. And the history of these things is they first started to appear in the 1930s when we were getting these combined neutral and earth connections. And ever since then, the DNOs have been well aware of circulating neutral currents beyond the neutral conductor and in other forms of earthing within premises. And they've been trying to counteract against that ever since. To the point, if you actually look in the regulations, they do have some documents in place to instruct a larger size of bonding conductor than maybe BS7671 tells us we should be using. And that's always something we need to consider as designers and installers. During the course of my training in the 1990s, I was made aware of the potential for these circulating currents. And again, that was repeated on my training whilst working alongside the DNOs in the early 2000s. So I've had exposure to this through the course of my career, but having spoken to other people in industry, that's maybe not the case for everyone. And raising a bit of awareness and knowledge on the subject is very important, especially as the DNO infrastructure at a street level starts to take more strain with the adoption of EV charge points and the exporting of electrical energy in the opposite direction to which way it was perhaps normally flowing. Now my view is in the fullness of time as PV and such things build up, the strain on the infrastructure at a street level will start to reduce, but we've got to go through a period of growing pains first which are unquestionably going to put some strain on that infrastructure, which could lead to more cases of these neutral and earth combined connections breaking down in the street. Now, if we have a look at the regulations first and foremost, we'll see what they tell us in terms of the size of our bonding conductors, and then we'll look at some of the reasons for that. So if we take a look in the big brown book, and in particular page 205, you can find section 544, which talks about protective bonding conductors. Now, in essence, it says, except where PME conditions apply, the main protective bonding conductor 
So we'll have a cross-sectional area that's not less than half the size of the earthing conductor. Now there are other things that play a part in that. If that cable is buried in the ground, for example, so it's not a simple look at that reg and choose half the size of the earth if you're on a TT or TNS, for example. But it's a good base point to start from. However, where PME conditions apply, there is a table we must use in terms of sizing our bonding. And that is because it's known these circulating currents may end up flowing through them. And we'll have a little look at the guidance notes and what that has to say about that in just a minute. But you can see here for a typical pen conductor that's 35 mil or less, you must have a 10 mil main protective bonding conductor. If it's 35 to 50 mil, that goes up to 16 millimeters. If it's 50 to 95, it must be 25. And the biggest example it gives is over 150 mil, must be 50 mil uh, squared cross-sectional area. So it's interesting that there is a difference there based on the earthing arrangement. And when we think about it, it makes sense because we're anticipating that on the loss of a pen conductor, there may be some large current flow through those cables that TNS and TT systems would not be seeing. So guidance note eight, which is the green book of the excellent series of guidance books the IT produced to supplement the regulations. And this is from the last version of the regs. It's not the current super duper up to date guidance document, but this section very much is still applicable as it was then. And it is section five within this guidance note. And it re relates to protective equipotential bonding. And it says here, the purpose of protective equipotential bonding should not be confused with earthing. That's something that is commonly mistook. Um, bonding serves the function of minimizing the magnitude of touch voltages within the building when an earth fault occurs in an installation. So that's making sure that all of the voltages rise to the same potential in essence. Um, and it goes on to say for a TNCS system, it will reduce touch voltages in the event of an open circuit pen fault on the supply. Touch voltages occur when an earth fault develops in the installation. An earth fault current is defined in BS7671 as a current resulting from a fault of negligible impedance between a line conductor and an exposed conductive part or a protective conductor. As this current flows to earth, touch voltages can be generated by the impedances between two or more exposed conductive parts, two or more extraneous conductive parts, exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts and exposed conductive parts and earth. And it goes on to give a diagram, sort of giving an example of what that is. So one of the clear understandings that it's important to take as a learner or trainee is the purpose of earthing is to limit the duration of touch voltages. And the purpose of protective equipotential bonding is to minimize the magnitude of these voltages. In essence, protective equipotential bonding will limit touch voltages to acceptable levels until the earth fault is automatically disconnected. So that's ADS. So it goes on to say on page 63, main bonding, or more correctly, main protective equipotential bonding, is required in most electrical installations. Such bonding is an essential part of the most commonly used measure of protection against electric shock, ADS. The first part of regulation 411.3.1.2 requires that in each installation, main protective bonding conductors complying with chapter 54 shall connect to the main earthing terminal extraneous conductive parts including the following so it's given some examples your water gas pipes other installation pipe work or ducting central heating air conditioning exposed metallic structural parts of the building so that's kind of setting out what we need to be bonding in terms of stuff that's in a building now the most interesting segment within guidance note 8 around pme earthing and bonding is on page 67 of this slightly out of date blue book copy of guidance note eight and it says here where PME conditions apply. In the event of an open circuit pen conductor on a TNCS system with PME, load currents may flow through the main protective bonding conductors and earthing of an installation. Consequently, for an installation where PME conditions apply, regulation 544.1.1 requires the main protective bonding conductors to be selected in relation to the pen conductor of the supply and table 54.8 regulation 542.3.1 also requires among other things that the earthing conductor shall meet those same requirements of regulation 544.1.1 and the data from table 54.8 is available in table 3.2 of this guidance note so it says as the earthing conductor also performs the function of a main protective bonding conductor 
The requirements of Regulation 544.1.1 should also be met for the earthing conductor so that the CSA of the earthing conductor is not less than that required for the main protective bonding conductors as well as meeting the requirements of Regulation 542.3.1. The electricity distributor may have particular requirements for the CSA of main protective bonding conductors which may exceed the minimum CSAs given in Table 54.8 if there is doubt in this respect, the electricity distributor should be consulted and guidance sought at an early stage of the design. The pen conductor referred to in column 1 of table 3.2 is that of the electrical distributor's low voltage supply to the installation. This is the combined protective and neutral pen or CNE conductor of the supply. It is not the neutral conductor on the consumer's supply of the supply terminals, which may have a smaller CSA as might be the case in a downstream distribution circuit feeding a separate building. Where the use of non-copper main protective bonding conductors is contemplated, the advice of the electricity distributor should be sought and followed. So that's clear guidance looking towards the DNO if PME conditions apply in terms of sizing our bonding conductors. And essentially that is because there's an acceptance that naturally we're going to see that current flowing, but equally when the pen breaks down, there's an understanding that those cables are going to need to carry more current than perhaps would otherwise be accept, expected and we need to size them accordingly during our designs. So we're very much aware of the issues that could be taking place out in the wider network impacting onto our installation that we're working on and using. So we need to make some measures as electricians to ensure that it remains safe within inside the equipotential zone. So it's clear from looking at that that if the equipotential zone has been designed and installed correctly the dangers to people within an installation and inside that equipotential zone should be minimised to the point it's not going to cause harm or fire. However, when those systems are deconstructed, typically by electricians carrying out our work, so for example, replacing a consumer unit, or perhaps replacing a main earth block, or anything of that nature where the system is deconstructed, then there could be danger present because we could have, in essence, two potentials in close proximity to each other that we could form part of that circuit. So it's really important to understand the reasons that we're checking for those currents and the magnitude of them and then the mitigating things we can do to help eliminate danger for ourselves whilst it's at play. And one of the reasons I think Guidance Note 3 in particular has included a mention of diverted neutral currents is because testing is another part when we may have the earthing system deconstructed. So for example, taking ZE measurements. And it's really important to have awareness as inspectors that these things could be present at a level that could be dangerous. And it mentions it on page 111 within Guidance Note 3, and it's under 3.3.3. Installations in which PME conditions apply can carry diverted neutral currents caused by open circuit protective earth and neutral conductor faults, pen faults. Diverted neutral currents may also be experienced in installations which share extraneous conductive parts, such as, such as conductive gas or water service pipes or structural steelwork, with installations in which PME conditions apply. So you might not have the PME arrangement in your installation, but if you could be sharing with um, a structural steel unit, for example, with a neighbour down the row who does, then you could import that into your property, so it's important to be aware of it even so. And it says here as a precaution, sorry, as a safety precaution for those carrying out inspection and testing, these types of installations should be checked before inspection and testing commences to determine if diverted neutral currents are present. And it says Appendix E describes a safety check procedure to identify diverted neutral currents. Now that's a typo in Guidance Note 3 because Appendix E does not exist. It's actually Appendix but we'll let them off on that one and it says safety checks for diverted neutral currents so this is telling you some of the things you can do to kind of check for this as I've shown in this video there are ways and means to be aware of it so it says here diverted neutral currents can occur if there is a break in the protective earth and neutral conductor in the distribution network supplying an installation diverted neutral currents can cause hazardous touch voltages on the protective earthing system in an installation including the main earthing terminal extraneous conductive parts, circuit protective conductors and exposed conductive parts. Installations that might be affected by diverted neutral currents include installations in which PME conditions apply, so that's your TNCF earthing arrangement from a public distribution network, or installations with TNS or TT earthing arrangements that share extraneous conductive parts 
with installations in which PME conditions apply. So really, it could be absolutely anywhere in the right circumstances. Precautions should be taken before working on any installation to determine if any hazardous touch voltages exist on conductive parts. This is particularly important when working outdoors and in contact with the general mass of earth, aka outside the equipotential zone. Precautions should also be taken before disconnecting any earthing or protective bonding conductors, as we just mentioned. Diverted neutral currents may originate from another installation and so may be present even if your installation is isolated and again John Ward demonstrated that beautifully on his video. You really, if you haven't seen it already, go off and check that out. Link in the description. And then it tells us how to check for diverted neutral currents. It says there's no simple test that will indicate the presence of diverted neutral currents. However, some simple checks can be made with voltage indicators, non-contact voltage testers, I don't like those, and the earth leakage current clamp ammeters along with an external earth fault loop impedance test. An example of an approach could be used in dwellings as shown in table D1. We'll have a look at that in a minute. If an open circuit pen conductor or diverted neutral currents are suspected after carrying out the checks, the DNO should be informed using telephone number 105. So if you do find it, report it to them. Now it does go on to give some examples of things you can do within these tables and I'm going to pick one or two of them out and go through them here. I'm not going to read the whole thing otherwise this is going to turn into a mammoth video. So if we look at table D1 on page 188 and 189 of guidance note 3, I'm not going to go into these in detail because I know most of you will have copies of this to hand or if you don't your training providers will definitely have them. It gives you eight steps you can take to try and monitor and see if there is any diverted neutral currents. The main one is around the demonstration I've made in this video using a clamp meter. So with the system in operation, check for any current flowing within the earthing conductor or your main protective bonding conductors. Anything over a few milliamps could be showing that there is a problem there. So those things would start to flag to you. Now the magnitude of those currents flowing would dictate if you are definite that there is a um, broken pen conductor or otherwise. So it's one of those where there's no set anything above one amp, 10 amps. You know, it's one of those where it is based on your understanding and assumption of the system in front of you. You're not going to get that guidance, but there is the statement that over a few milliamps, you're going to start wanting to think about it. Now, one of the other um, checks it says to do is running through your safe isolation procedure. If you happen to notice voltages between different parts, then that's something else where you might start to have those red flags popping up in your mind. When you're disconnecting your main protective bonding conductors, if you notice anything, so as John Ward demonstrated on his video, if you see any sparks or something that doesn't look quite right, that's something that would be a red flag to tell you to stop what you're doing and have a think. And the same when you're reconnecting those conductors as well. So go and check that out. It's page 188 and 189 of Guidance Note 3. It really sets it out very well in a written form just to say some of the things you can do. The only bit of it I don't really agree with is the use of non-contact -vol non voltage indicators as I've shown on this video earlier on. Now it is important to remember that thankfully the loss of pen conductors is exceptionally rare which is why the TNCS earthing arrangement is so widely adopted in the UK. I think the last figures that were published showed around four or five hundred incidents per year and of that a very small percentage that resulted in a dangerous circumstance for any occupants or electricians. However, it's important to realise that when those things do present, the potential for danger is very much there, either for a user of an installation, if they happen to have an equipotential zone that's not installed in the way it should be, or if they can get outside of it and come into contact with those bonded services, the external gas pipe, for example, and also other trades who may be deconstructing gas pipes and water pipes, for example, who might not be aware of this through the course of their normal training as electricians are. So it's really good to get this advice out there and guidance into industry from all parts of social media and the industry bodies such as the IET as well coming forward with some stuff and other industry brands and bodies as well I'm sure are joining in with all of that and that is fantastic. But we do need to be a little bit realistic in the level of degree of occurrence of this I guess is what I'm saying. At a DNO level when we think of all the faults they're dealing with day to day due to loss of supply, over and under voltages, frequency wonder, trying to keep harmonics under control, both at a high voltage and a low voltage network is really very difficult and when they're seeing all the statistics around all of this and the pen fault occurrence is so low you can understand where they're not as concerned with it as perhaps electricians who are worried about coming into contact with it day to day 
might be. So I get it at that level. I can totally resonate with their point of view and understanding. And one of the things we should be avoiding is speculating on where these things have occurred and the potential um, ramifications of those occurrences in the final outcomes, if you like. I've seen some really poor stuff on social media the last uh, couple of weeks and more historically in an article the IET published maybe six months to a year ago linking diverted neutral currents with the horrible and tragic events of Grenfell. I think that is something that unless absolutely rock solid and certain about we should be really careful due to respect for everyone who was involved in that horrendous um, event. So uh, it's not a, a road or avenue I would like to go down Ask the question, of course, of the people carrying out the investigations and, you know, hold them to account in presenting that evidence in an appropriate way. But to publicly state that it had a direct effect on that, I think is poor form. It's just a personal view and it's something that I will not be doing in the content of this video. It's all about education and trying to share the little bit of knowledge I have around diverted neutral currents with other people who may be coming into contact with it in the day to day and if you're an occupier of a premises. And there was a fantastic video that the IET had up around diverted neutral current as well. Unfortunately, that's no longer available after um, the sad passing of the presenter and the subsequent removal of that content, which I totally understand. And some of the great work Spen have done as well around investigating some of the things that occurred within the Scottish region in particular around diverted neutral currents causing gas explosions and voltages to present on gas systems. Really important work and fantastic that that has been shared out and understood by industry so we can be aware of these things, try and um, highlight them, detect them and prevent them becoming a serious issue. Which leads on to some of the technology that's available for us to try and use to counteract against these faults because all of the approaches we're taking so far where we're having these um, additional earth rods that we're installing for island in mode and such can all have an impact on perhaps masking the loss of um, a neutral and earth combined pen conductor within the DNA network because we're essentially providing more paths back through to the transformer in the mass of earth and other such things by consequence of what we're doing. So you can have devices from a company called Matty. I've seen them recently advertising on LinkedIn, a new product they've got that monitors the voltage on all of the line neutral and earth conductors and on the event of a loss of pen they can make um, users of an installation aware and even have those things automatically shut down should that be the design setup. So there's really clever technology out there that's able to identify and spot these things and make people aware of them so that rectification works can take place rather than these things being hidden until an electrician happens to come across it either through the course of carrying out tests of the kind I've shown on this video or by accident when they've deconstructed earthing systems unaware of the potential danger and thus had an incident. So those kind of things are stuff that we should definitely be looking at specking on new designs and also perhaps considering in terms of EICRs and recommendations going forward in my personal opinion. So there we have it, I've run through these things lots before on short form content. If you go over to my main YouTube channel, Mark the Sparky Allison, there is short on that, there's reels on Instagram. I've tried to share the bit of knowledge I've got around diverted neutral currents with other people over the last probably five or ten years and more on social media platforms. It's something that's always been there, it's always going to be there while we use these type of earthing arrangements in the UK and just a bit of awareness of it because the people who are at most risk are electricians while installations are deconstructed. So having some awareness of what we can do to check for it and then also put a safe system of work in place for while we are doing electrical work because the other thing is you could go to carry out these checks on an installation and start swapping a consumer unit for example meanwhile down the street the pen conductors broke while you're at work and you've got all of those earthing cables that you've diligently checked before you've started the task and suddenly they start having a potential for a problem to be on them so maybe we need to be thinking about encasing those cables while we are carrying out work or having um, voltage indicators connected to them perhaps in some way to monitor for a rise in voltage whilst we are at work. It's not just the point we carry out those checks. There could be something develop through the course of our day. You know, if you're swapping out a three-phase DB board, for example, that might take you a weekend. It's not something that you're doing in five minutes, is it? So it's something to keep in mind and be aware of. Um, as I say, it really is nothing new. These things have been around since the 1930s. There is a lot of understanding at the design stage for electricians who are putting installations together. It's in the guidance notes, it's in the regs. 
It's been in there for a long time and measures should be at place so users of installations have those um, problems mitigated to as minimal level as possible. Now, obviously when you're outside the equipotential zone, you may have an external gas pipe, for example, exposed out on the wall. There is an issue there where a user of an installation could be putting the bins out, for example, and come into contact with it and the mass of air. So there are situations within um, an installation where those touch voltages can present a danger, even with a fully designed in and working equipotential zone. So it's always something to have in the back of your mind and check for at every job you go to and it's pretty simple to do as I've shown earlier on in this video. If you've got any questions in and around diverted neutral currents or air thin systems in general please do drop them in below. I hope this video has been of some use and as I've said all the way through this please do go off and watch JW's, JW's video if you haven't already. I'm sure you have. He's an absolute YouTube megastar and that is another excellent video that clearly sets out the problem at hand. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.